Hi, this is uh, Gord Galvin of Quarry Gardens in uh, Scottsburg, Nova Scotia. Uh, I'm going to do uh, this video, uh, probably about 10 minutes long, on uh, uh, a permaculture design uh, project that we have here. Uh, it started um, in the uh, spring of last year uh, when I had the opportunity to purchase this property, but we've uh, been living on and working on a piece of property across the road for two years. So we had a a fair degree of familiarity uh, with the weather and the area, uh, and uh, as I've spent a lot of time here in my youth and uh, and later, since I have some understanding of the uh, of what's available in the area, uh, these are important considerations. You know what services are available, whether you're a part of a community or not. Uh, fortunately, I am part of a community here, so I've been able to benefit from uh, a lot of uh, assistance in trying to establish the systems here. Uh, it's a six-acre property. Uh, the area behind me is the is the north. Uh, starting in a permaculture design, you want to work for, from high to low, perhaps, and but also from north to south when you're viewing your drawings. It's always good to look at that. So the PowerPoint presentation I've done uh, uh, shows some of that as well too. Um, the uh, the property is uh, uh, starts at the north east corner, which is uh, bounded by the Condon Road. And uh, the boundary for the uh, west and the north side is a brook that flows down along the edge of the property and back out onto the Condon Road. Uh, uh, one of the, um, the uh, considerations when we bought the property was it actually has a pretty good protection from the north and the west uh, winds, which are predominant in this area. And uh, although the house is on the highest point uh, uh, on, on the property, which you'll see in a little bit, uh, the house sits at about 97 meters above sea level, and uh, the uh, the area here is uh, it's a zone 5B. Uh, it seems that the springs have been uh, drifting a little bit into summer, and the summers have been drifting a bit into fall, though, far, as far as when the days occur without frost. Um, we've got uh, pretty good experience uh, w with the weather here. Uh, we get uh, ample amounts of moisture throughout the year, but... Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, for I believe three of the last four years, we've actually suffered uh, drought conditions. So water management is key. The, the soils here are very sandy and, uh, and well draining. So uh, uh, although you may get a lot of water, it doesn't stay in the ground very long unless you have a lot of humus there. So we're working on put, uh, putting humus in the soil on this property. As I said, it's, uh, it's a six acre former farmstead site, which we're gonna walk around now. had been run as a family farm for uh, many years. Um, not, uh, not farmed in any kind of an industrial fashion, uh, very few inputs. Uh, they kept a family cow, they had pigs, uh, they had uh, gardens. Um, this all kind of uh, uh, slowed down to some small gardens and uh, I don't think any livestock since the 1990s, but uh, they, uh, they did one thing religiously which helped keep the, uh, the humus in the soil was they, they cut the lawn uh, three times a year uh, which, uh, which in effect helped uh, ensure that the, uh, that the soil stayed intact and, and, and relatively healthy um, and the humus levels grown. So we have about uh, anywhere between six and eight inches of top so maybe a little less on the really steep slopes and a little more on the, on the really flat areas. Um, but uh, in that range, and, and the, uh, the, the, the soils are, uh, uh, as I said before, uh, quite sandy, uh, a bit of silt and, uh, and gravel as well, but, uh, but still uh, have a fair bit of humus. The, um, as I mentioned before, the, uh, the house sits at 97 meters above uh, sea level. Uh, incidentally, so does the uh, the, the brook, uh, which I mentioned, which uh, makes the uh, boundary of the property uh, just uh, to my uh, north. But uh, there's a transition from one end of the property to the other. It's about 800 meters from the, uh, along the Condon Road uh, through the property, and from 97 meters height uh, where the house is, it drops uh, eight meters uh, to the rest of the uh, uh, along the, the rest of the property. Uh, from the house to the north end of the property, which is maybe a hundred uh, meters, uh, it only drops uh, uh, about uh, two meters. So we have um, 
we have a, uh, a pretty good opportunity here to, uh, to capture water throughout the landscape. Uh, as we got a little further uh, down along the, uh, the, the west edge of the property, it turned out there was a fair amount of clay there. I guess as it's, this property sits more or less at the base of the uh, hardwood hill, uh, uh, further up the hill, uh, the property I own, I noticed that there's a lot of uh, good sized boulders. Uh, about uh, 400 or 500 meters down, they're small boulders, and when you get down into here, you're into gravel, the odd boulder, but mostly gravel and sand, and then at the very bottom, it's just filled with beautiful clay for building ponds. So. One of the, uh, the guiding principles for the, for the design uh, was going to be the, uh, the use of animals and uh, uh, to, to help us with our, our processes, but, uh, but primarily is to, is to grow and uh, develop food for the area. Uh, for my, uh, my personal community, uh, which extends beyond my family now, actually the more we do here, the greater our community becomes and, and, and the greater the opportunities become to grow food. So a lot of uh, uh, what, I, what, what I do with respect to this property are, and, and in the design is think about uh, trying to feed 100 people uh, with six acres, which is probably impossible because, uh, you know, human nutrition, you need about a thousand uh, pounds a year. Uh, so what we're talking about is 100,000 pounds of food. So. Uh, I probably can't generate 100,000 pounds of food off of this property, but it can become a nursery for some surrounding properties that I own. So everything is done with the eye towards uh, uh, getting to that, uh, that 100,000 pounds of food. The, the water on the property here is, uh, it comes from uh, springs on the, on the side of uh, Hardwood Hill and uh, to my knowledge has never dried up, but uh, I'm not really one for, uh, for faith. so. The plan is to actually build some water containment uh, uh, adjacent to the house. Uh, we're, uh, we're utilizing uh, water capture uh, right now only by uh, capturing it in our gardens, uh, but uh, the plan is in the, uh, in the very near future is to uh, build a ferrocement uh, cistern in the basement. However, there's a large old wood boiler that has to come out first because that's, uh, that's where the cistern is going. Um, we're uh, we're going to utilize uh, the um, uh, slow uh, 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 slow sand filtration for um, for uh, cleaning our waters in uh, in our domestic use. Uh, there'll also be water captured in the outside in a in a series of ponds, which I'll, which I'll show you shortly as well. If anybody's wondering how one hand, one armed man can uh, contour a map on the side of a 5% slope, this is the tool. That's an A-frame. Once you have it set on a level, you can roll it across your landscape, pin your flags wherever they're level, and set your, uh, set your contours. Of course, you knew that, Rob. Uh, but uh, for those that, uh, that don't know how contour mapping is, uh, is uh, best achieved in, uh, in certain cases, there's a quick and dirty way to do it and uh, you don't need to get a drone uh, or a GPS. Uh, most of the early contour mapping was actually done with a, uh, with a Sharpie and some pictures, uh, downloads from Google Earth and tracing the cursor on the screen while simultaneously drawing the contours of the property. Uh, you can get to a half a meter with Google Earth. Um, I'm sure there's uh, much more sophisticated uh, <laughs> systems. You could use LiDAR or a few other things, but uh, uh, this is what we use for the fine mapping uh, between the, uh, the half, meter, half meter contours. So I'm pretty comfortable with, uh, with our results that we've been getting so far. So as far as house changes to, uh, to build into this design change, we've decided to, uh, to uh, put a, a wash house here. Uh, it was originally uh, going to be a bath house, but uh, I think uh, now that we have cows and, uh, and chickens and pigs and 
uh, soon to be sheep and goats all living uh, within 100 yards. Just might as well expand on this uh, on this concept a little bit. Uh, so it'll be a wash house. It'll be designed for washing up uh, all manner of gear and or people. Um, the, uh, the, the, the house uh, will also have on its, uh, on its south exposure. Uh, it's, it's not an ideal exposure here because of uh, uh, some sun shading. Uh, due to the adjacent structures, but uh, the plan is to have uh, at least enough uh, southwest exposure to uh, maintain uh, about a 64 square foot uh, gray water bed, uh, which I'm, uh, I'm assuming will, or I'm hoping will, uh, will manage all of the gray water from both the, both the bathhouse as well as the house. Uh, this is a bit of an experiment to see how it might work in an urban setting if, I, if, uh, if a 64 square foot uh, gray water system uh, uh, or about 130 uh, cubic feet will be sufficient to, to manage uh, our, daily, uh, our daily needs. But I might be undersized, but uh, that's all right. We've got other things we can do with gray water. Uh, underneath the bathhouse, uh, the plan is to uh, install a uh, ferro-cement biogas digester, perhaps ferro-cement, perhaps cinder block construction. The actual details of the construction are still being worked out, but it's going to be underneath this structure uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is proximity to, uh, to decent feedstock um, uh, with, the, uh, with the animal waste uh, being, being right beside us here. Uh, the other is proximity to where I'd like it to go, which is the kitchen uh, right behind us. So uh, the idea behind the biogas is to, to produce gas for uh, cooking and perhaps heat. Uh, we'll get by cooking first and then we'll, uh, and we'll see where it goes from there. But if we have excess, uh, we'll use it to heat hot water. Um, the bathhouse, which is, uh, as I said, going to be located here on the west side of the house, uh, directly outside of the current laundry room. Uh, will uh, will also um, encompass a, uh, uh, a wood burning uh, um, uh, hot water heating system, which will tie to the gray water system uh, in the event of uh, extended cold periods and where the the solar uh, uh, aspects and uh, and uh, heat rust uh, or uh, rather thermal mass of the foundation biogas base etc are insufficient will uh, burn wood to, to heat water to, to maintain the temperature. Uh, ultimately the plan will be to use the gas from biogas to, to pick up that loop if required. Uh, so we're trying to we're trying to get a whole bunch of things stacked in, in, in this one building um, but the but the primary one is going to be the uh, um, the uh, the bathhouse. We want that bathtub uh, overflowing with hot water. <laughs> One of these days soon, because I tell you, there's a lot of days I could use a good bath around here. Mm -hmm. The northeast corner of our uh, of our permaculture orchard, uh, which we uh, we started working on uh, we, the design of it a year and a half ago, but, but it was for a slightly different location, and uh, and we fine tuned it and fine tuned it and fine tuned it and. Uh, and this spring, uh, we're able to uh, to do the planting. Um, this area here was uh, essentially uh, unused. It was uh, mown three times a year for the last 20, 25 years. Uh, it had a good thick mat of sod on it. And underneath that, there was a really hard crust, uh, probably from the water flowing down this hill uh, over time and maybe early plowing. Uh, anyhow, we... Uh, we uh, treated the area with a uh, with a uh, work saver subsoiler down to uh, basically drew a slit in the soil about 25 inches or so a couple feet plus maybe uh, on the contour after we'd laid the contours out here uh, these contours are laid out 12 feet apart uh, and we did that uh, that break in the crust to uh, to help store a bit of water in the soils uh, within a week or two you could actually notice uh, uh, rising up on the, and it's still it's still present to this day where it, where it sort of flattened out the top of, of that portion of the contour and it's starting to actually create a uh, an effect on the landscape uh, where the water came in and added uh, uh, a little more light to the soil. About, uh, now it's allowing the roots to penetrate down into those places. So these are bare rootstock trees that we planted a week ago and uh, they didn't have anything on them 
when they went in the ground and they're all leafing. So I'm extremely happy. Um, the, um, the idea behind this orchard is to uh, to space your uh, your trees in a uh, in a nap format, uh, which is a nitrogen fixture, an apple, and a pear. Uh, a pear could also be a prunus, uh, as in a plum or a cherry, um, peaches, pawpaws, persimmons, etc. Those all count as the peas. Uh, in fact, we did plan on putting them in here, but uh, we ended up getting too many trees or picking too many trees out, so. We're going to go a little further uh, down into the landscape here where, where we've got a real nice warm spot for some of the soft fruit and ones that uh, might not do quite as well here. Um, the, uh, the nap, uh, again, as I said, has you planting a nitrogen fixing tree, which in this case are the horticulturalist's uh, favorite trees, the black uh, locust. Uh, considered an invasive species in some places, probably, but uh, it's an amazing tree. Uh, it does a whole bunch of things. Uh, fixes tree, uh, fixes nitrogen. Uh, it uh, it's going to provide some amazing firewood uh, when we coppice it. It uh, drops uh, great big pods of uh, of seeds that the chickens love. Uh, it has uh, amazing, beautiful flowers that you can actually read off the branches if you wanted to. Uh, the bees love them. They're high in both uh, nectar and pollen, uh, so they're an amazing tree. Uh, we planted uh, 80 of them uh, last weekend, 45 here, and another 30 in a food hedge or a fedge that we're running around the exterior of the property. Um, the, uh, the, the idea is to use uh, animals as much as possible in our landscaping, as you'd probably be able to see by uh, uh, by the, uh, the number of animals that we have here. Uh, they're creating most of the disturbance. Uh, we're working with them. This is my friend Hook. Uh, story. Uh, I won't tell any of them. Uh, the, uh, a lot of the contour mapping was done from Google Earth and, uh, and simply tracing uh, uh, the images as a, 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 in correspondence with the, uh, with the cursor showing you the variation in your, in your elevation. Uh, it's pretty easy to figure out how to do it. Once you do, then you can see where water is going to move on your property and how it's going to move. Um, uh, this is this is critical. Uh, your understanding of, uh, of the lay of your land and, and where the nutrients are going to be being deposited and, uh, and and what what you're going to be losing where. Um, but Google also has a has a couple of other uh, opportunities. Uh, Google Earth. Um, there's a function where uh, on the Google Maps uh, when you're looking at the satellite view of your property, uh, bring it in as close as you can. Uh, if you can figure it out, you can start looking at previous years. So now, uh, not only are you looking at how your your property looks maybe this year or last year, last time the satellite went over, uh, but it uh, you can see how uh, over time, uh, I was able to see a number of old garden sites. I was able to see a number of uh, well, the road where it, where it drove right through the front of the of the house. Um, you could see. Uh, how the property had been used and uh, and or abused, if the case was. In this case, there wasn't abuse. This property was really well, quite well looked after, actually. Um, one of the things, though, that I did notice in Google Earth all that time was a great green streak that came from here all the way down through the property. And a real wet, marshy-looking area and all of that. And, uh, you know, I just assumed that it was probably the septic overflow or something but I mean it was one old man lived in this house for 20 years that I mean he wasn't going to fertilize two acres of landscape the way this had been doing and I thought well there's got to be a spring there and um, uh, I was a little high up in the land when I first started uh, uh, looking for it and assuming I was going to be able to dig myself a nice little pond uh, so I've decided that that's going to be our in-ground greenhouse which we wanted to do there anyhow. Um, the, uh, the first pond is now uh, located uh, just in front of that, and we only started digging that yesterday, uh, uh, or two days ago rather, and uh, it hasn't been um, uh, allowed to fill actually. We've got a couple of bypasses here 
Uh, this, this second pond in the sequence here is going to be a uh, pond for wild rice. Um, it's, uh, it's something I've been wanting to try for a while. It'll grow in this region. Uh, you have 72 hours from the time it's harvested, where it's harvested, to have it in your pond uh, on this end. But once you get by that hurdle and you have the right water flow and the right water level management and the right substrate in your, in your pond, um, hopefully uh, that should be one of our crops here. Uh, the upper pond will be a duck pond and uh, fathead minnows and uh, probably uh, a number of aquatic plants that, uh, that, not probably, there will be a number of aquatic plants that Sheila's got, uh, got picked out uh, uh, for it uh, to feed uh, both fish as well as the, uh, the ducks uh, that are going to be in the area. This will be the, uh, the location of the duck house down here. Uh, which we've got to get finished very quickly because the number of ducks on this property is embarrassing. Uh, As, as we're developing the uh, the property, the uh, one of the keys is going to be water capture. Um, we're uh, the, the estimates I have for the uh, the orchards and the number of animals that we're keeping here. Uh, we're going to require about 5,000 gallons a week at uh, at peak usage. I mean, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. Uh, and uh, and and the the thoughts behind that was I was going to get a lot more than that in hand. Uh, we've had, as I said, a number of droughts. These always occur at the worst times for, uh, for people. Uh, the, the, it might seem like we have a, a wet climate in Nova Scotia because it's always raining when we want it to be dry. But trust me, uh, there's times when it's, uh, when it's dry when we, when we want it to rain. And, uh, and that hasn't been happening a lot. Um, so uh, the water storage on this property, once I had a pretty good understanding that it was going to hold water the way it was, the, the way it would, in an area of the property that could quite easily be, uh, uh, be managed, uh, and really on our zone two's uh, doorstep, um, uh, and, but, but didn't have any real good use for us otherwise. Um, we now have, uh, I'm going to say, approximately 1,500 cubic meters of water, or about 400,000 gallons of water storage capability, or we'll have once the, once the ponds are, are completed and the, uh, the inlets are turned on and the outlets are turned off and, uh, and it's allowed to fill. Um, really looking forward to that. That's happening this week. Um, These are pigs, they're Berkshire hogs, uh, three of them, and then uh, two of the other ones are Tamworth land race crosses. Um, the, uh, the, the chicken breeds have all been selected for their, uh, for their various uh, attributes, but they, there was a, kind of a list of fundamentals that we wanted to go with. One was uh, cold hardiness, you know, they had to be hardy in this environment. Uh, they had to be docile, they had to get along with, uh, with all kinds of other animals. Um, they had to be, um, hey guys, they, they had to uh, be, for the most part, uh, of a reasonable body size in case we wanted to eat them, uh, although a couple of uh, smaller birds have gotten in based on, the, uh, on, on their personalities or their nice egg, egg colors. Uh, but for the most part, they're, they're dual purpose uh, heritage birds. Uh, where possible, uh, we're trying to um, uh, maintain uh, uh, heritage breeds that are endangered. Um, the Emden geese uh, are an endangered breed, as are the uh, white belts full uh, turkeys, or the belts full white turkeys, uh, which we have. Um, the uh, Berkshire hogs are, are becoming more, more popular, but uh, they're also on the Nature Conservancy watch list. Um, some of the chickens, the uh, um, uh, the speckled Sussex, I believe, is uh, is endangered. Uh, this one that we've got, uh, we've also uh, got the breast uh, hens uh, here, which are reputed to be the uh, the best tasting chicken in the world. But uh, I haven't eaten one yet. Uh, I'll get back to you on that. But uh, the idea is for this system to regenerate uh, 
so we have uh, two of these Berkshires are going to be uh, founding sows for food production. One will be dusting for food, and uh, the two uh, kids of Tamworth uh, will be few, will be food uh, prized for their uh, <laughs> for their bacon due to their long bodies. Uh, the Berkshires are uh, prized for their fatty uh, meat and uh, at least a certain sort of Hi, this is Gord Galvin at uh, Quarry Gardens. Uh, my partner, uh, Sheila, and I um, started uh, here in November last year uh, with the intention of uh, creating a, uh, um, uh, an incubator for food production um, with, a, with a strong focus on uh, heritage breeds and, uh, and the use of, uh, of diversity as a, as a tool to to um, leverage growth, as it were, in, in, in the real world, um, you know, the, uh, uh, so our plan is to introduce as, uh, as much diversity with respect to our animals and our plantings and, uh, and encourage as much of the local natural uh, diversity as possible and to try and, uh, and get them working together as much as possible by um, structuring natural uh, systems with um, domesticated animals uh, playing a role and uh, and plantings of uh, uh, a wide variety of uh, from a wide variety of locations um, after we've determined their suitability to you know to interact in the environment that that, that we're placing them in which is here at Quarry Gardens uh, in Scottsbury, Nova Scotia.